Welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to have a Grand Round speaker today, Dr. Katrina Dottelson. Um, and we have our moderator, Dr. Joel Wazen. Uh, Joel, you can start uh, with the introduction whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, and, uh, as, and as always, you can uh, mention your name and country if you like uh, in the chat and welcome everyone. Sounds good. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at Health for the World for our weekly international grand rounds. I am Joelle Wazen, radiology resident at the University of Massachusetts and member of the Health for the World UMass chapter. Today's topic is on breast imaging, common cases, and will be presented by one of the brilliant women in radiology, Dr. Katerina Doddleson. Dr. Doddleson is a board certified radiologist specializing in women's imaging. She is an associate professor of radiology at Weill Cornell Medical College and attending radiologist at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. She also serves as the associate program director of the radiology residency training program and of the breast imaging fellowship training program. Dr. Doddleson's clinical expertise and research interests include the optimization of breast cancer surveillance techniques for high-risk populations and the utility of breast MRI and prediction of tumor behavior. She is an editorial board member and reviewer for the Journal of Clinical Imaging. And with that introduction, I turn it to you, Dr. Doddleson. Thank you so much, Dr. Wazen, and thank you for having me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all uh, who are joining. And um, we'll get started in the interest of time. So I thought I would cover some of the common presentations that are seen um, in a breast imaging, that uh, these are common complaints and common scenarios that would be encountered, whether one is a specialized uh, breast imager or a generalized uh, or a general radiologist. So the overview, uh, the topics we're gonna to touch on are palpable masses, breast asymmetries, nipple discharge, nipple retraction, and then we'll um, touch on the male breast and male breast disease. So let's jump right in. Um, so a palpable breast abnormality is uh, really actually the second most frequent presenting um, complaint to the uh, breast imaging clinic. The first most common one being uh, breast pain. Um, and although the majority of palpable masses are benign, it is one of the most frequent presenting features of breast carcinoma when it is uh, clinically um, apparent. The workup for uh, palpable masses depends on the patient's age. The, the important thing to remember is that the major, even though the majority of palpable masses are benign, imaging workup is necessary because physical examination um, is not uh, sufficient in differentiating benign from malignant masses. There are actually um, pretty famous historic studies where um, they had uh, several dedicated breast surgeons evaluating 100 palpable uh, breast uh, areas of concern. And they agreed with each other in only 25% of the cases, whether it was benign or malignant. And what's more, they actually agreed with themselves in less than 50% of the cases, and they were not correct in the majority uh, of uh, in the majority of diagnoses. And this is not because they are terrible surgeons, it's because the physical examination is just not reliable enough. And as such, uh, imaging evaluation for any palpable area of concern is necessary, although again, reassuring women uh, as much as it is important, majority will be benign. And the workup depends on the patient's age, and we'll talk about why in a second. So we'll start with the first patient population, which is women over 40 who are in the United States um, are recommended to undergo annual screening mammography for evaluation of cancer in order to um, reduce mortality from breast cancer or have the maximal reduction in mortality, which is achieved to be about 40%. So a woman who is in this screening age, over 40, who presents with palpable area of concern, um, if she hadn't had a recent mammogram in the last six months, we proceed with a diagnostic mammogram. Diagnostic mammography is done anytime a patient is uh, symptomatic in any fashion. If the diagnostic mammogram is negative, it behooves us to proceed with an ultrasound in order to achieve the highest negative predictive value uh, with a combination of both tests. So when you have a mammogram and an ultrasound in a woman over 40, who uh, both of which are negative, we achieve a negative predictive value of greater than 97%, meaning if it's negative, that there's truly no cancer there. 
if we do see a suspicious finding on the diagnostic mammogram that corresponds to palpable area of concern, still behooves us to do an ultrasound to see if we can actually potentially sample uh, the area of concern under sonography, which is much easier than doing it uh, stereotactically, both for the patient and oftentimes for us. Um, and if, on the other hand, what we see on the diagnostic mammogram is benign and corresponds to palpable area of concern, we can stop and reassure the patient. If she recently had a mammogram within the last six months, we can just start with an ultrasound and go from there. On the other hand, in a patient who is under age 30, the incidence of breast cancer is very low. It's less than 1% worldwide. And the sensitivity of mammography is not that high because there is increased breast density um, oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, as a trend, not as a rule. Um, and the sensitivity of an ultrasound actually in this population for palpable areas of concern is 100%. What's more, the negative predictive value of an ultrasound in these women with a very low incidence of breast cancer in this age population is also 100%. As such, ultrasound is really the primary workhorse for evaluation of palpable abnormalities in this age group. If uh, a woman presents with a, uh, a woman under 30 presents with a palpable area of concern, an ultrasound is done and is negative, you, because of its 100% negative predictive value, um, we can reassure the patient and just recommend clinical correlation. If we see something that is benign, uh, which is often the case and very common in these young women, such as cysts, we can stop, reassure the patient and just recommend clinical correlation. If we do see something that meets our probably benign or BIRATS three criteria, which is oval parallel well circumscribed masses, um, usually commonly reflecting fibroadenomas, this is sort of where it gets tricky and, and, and um, branches from the official recommendations and clinical recommendations. So according to the ATLAS, the last edition, which is now being updated, the fifth edition that was published in 2013, um, all of the studies which evaluated probably benign masses on ultrasound were done in asymptomatic patients. As such, the recommendation is that if there is anything palpable, even if it does meet the probably benign criteria, to pursue uh, proceed with uh, a bias, even though the suspicion is low. However, the ATLAS does concede that there have been now studies um, that uh, evaluated the PPV of malignancy or positive predictive value of malignancy of these oval parallel well circumscribed masses that are palpable. Um, and those, the PPV is actually also less than 2%. So again, that is something that is compatible with a BIRATS-3. So the, ultra, uh, the ALICE does concede that the use of probably benign assessment for a palpable lesion, although not supported by still by robust scientific data can be considered giving uh, several single institution large studies, which is, uh, report successful outcomes for palpable lesions. You can imagine that there shouldn't be much of a difference between a palpable and unpalpable mass with similar morphologic features. One can just be uh, more superficial, and that's why it's palpable, versus a little deeper. Now, finally, if in this patient population you see a suspicious binding on an ultrasound, which corresponds to palpable area of concern, although you can proceed to a biopsy, you may want to consider doing a mammogram to look for further extent of disease. And then finally, the sort of in-between uh, patient population that's left over, the 30 to 39-year-old group that is usually not screened unless they are high risk, you can start with either mammogram and an ultrasound or an ultrasound. It's up to you. The discretion uh, is yours. Um, and then if one is negative, however, the negative predictive value of an ultrasound now decreases in this patient population and the incidence of breast cancer increases slightly. Therefore, Whichever one you start with, if it is negative, it behooves you to proceed with the other one in order to achieve the highest negative predictive value. Although still majority in, uh, of palpable masses in this age group are benign and tend to be much more commonly sonographically apparent uh, than mammographically. So ultrasound still has a higher sensitivity in this age group than mammogram, just not as high as in the, their younger cohort. So let's look at some examples. So we have a 53 year old woman who presented with a left breast new palpable mass. So the first study would therefore be, since she's symptomatic, a diagnostic mammogram. So uh, the uh, standard clinical care is to place some sort of marker. The markers vary over the palpable area of concern. Here we can see uh, a beakly triangular marker demarcating patients palpable. 
in, for it, to further uh, evaluate the area of palpable concern adequately, spot compression views are recommended. And the reason for that is that it is, uh, we are then exerting the same amount of force as we do for a full field uh, mammogram over a smaller surface area in order to increase our resolution and evaluation of the area. You can see that she is heterogeneously or maybe even extremely dense um, and nothing is really definitively apparent just on these diagnostic images. This is her spot compression view. We can see the palpable marker and subjacent to it very vaguely we see, and we only, and this is why I'm only showing one view is because it was so far posterior, we only saw this on one view. We see uh, the speculated mass, which corresponds to palpable area of concern. So that already raises your suspicion, certainly, but now it behooves you to proceed to an ultrasound to see if this, something, this is something that has a sonographic correlate and as such, can then be uh, sampled sonographically. So this is our ultrasound and corresponding to that palpable area of concern as was nicely um, denoted by the sonographer, we see uh, an irregular, taller than wide, not well circumscribed mass, hypochoic, posterior acoustic shattering. So now what um, are we going to recommend in this patient? Given these features, which are definitely um, have a higher PPV than 2% of malignancy, uh, we would need to uh, recommend a tissue sampling. So this would be a BIRAS category four. Um, and uh, the best uh, um, sampling would be achieved under ultrasound for patient convenience, less radiation, and also uh, ease of sampling with confirmation of your needle in real time uh, with sonographic uh, guidance compared to stereotech. Next case is a 21-year-old woman who presented with left palpable mass. What is our next step then based on our imaging evaluation? Well, as we discussed, in this patient population, the incidence of breast cancer is less than 1%. Sensitivity of an ultrasound is 100%, as is its negative predictive value. So the best uh, next step imaging evaluation would be left breast ultrasound. So this is the ultrasound that was done. And we see that correlating to palpable area of concern in her left breast to clock axis is a novel, well circumscribed, anechoic, so there are no echoes internally, uh, parallel mass with posterior acoustic enhancement. So what are our bi-reds and recommendations based on this? This is a benign finding. This is a simple cyst, bi category two. We can reassure the patient and recommend that she, unless she has other high risk factors, she returns for screening mammography at age 40. Always take the opportunity to educate the patient about screening guidelines and the importance of um, breast imaging uh, screening. On the other hand, now is our final palpable patient who presented as a 38 year old who presented with a new left palpable area of concern. As we mentioned, we can start either with a mammogram or ultrasound. In this case, we begin with mammography. And this, these are her diagnostic mammograms. You have the uh, uh, lateral view or 90 degree FFDM, full field digital mammogram and our spot compression views. Um, this, a different marker was placed here. Uh, this was a different institution uh, over palpable area of concern, which is this linear marker. And we see based on the spot compression views of the region that subjacent to the palpable marker, there are two well circumscribed lucent masses with uh, peripheral calcifications, which are almost actual in quality. So what does that make us think of? Let's see. What are our bi and recommendations? Would we proceed with a targeted ultrasound? Would we follow this up? Or would we return her to screening? Well, this, these are classic and characteristic uh, features of benign fat necrosis, centrally lucent, well-circumscribed masses, which start to calcify peripherally as granula granulation tissue matures. Um, and this is a benign, definitively characteristically benign uh, finding on mammography, which corresponds to palpable area of concern. We can stop. There's no need to evaluate with an ultrasound and reassure the patient. So bar it's two, see you in a year. So those are masses. The next topic uh, we'll touch on, uh, which is commonly encountered in breast imaging, are asymmetries. Unlike masses, asymmetries have concave outward margins versus a mass, which has convex margins. 
There are four types of asymmetries. If it is seen only on one view, it's just called an asymmetry. If it's seen in two views, it's called a focal asymmetry. And if it's a, um, if it is seen in one or two views, but takes over more than an entire quadrant, it's called a global asymmetry. And finally, if this asymmetry is changing over time, a better definition or a better characterization of it is a developing asymmetry. So it's something either new or increasing, becoming more dense. So the evaluation or the, the actual uh, characteristics of asymmetries, majority can be benign, although all can reflect uh, breast cancer. An asymmetry that is seen only in one of the standard views most of the time reflects just summation artifact, but does carry with it about a 2% risk of malignancy. A global asymmetry, which as I mentioned, if it takes on, uh, which is defined as any asymmetric tissue in one side compared to the other breast, uh, then uh, that occupies more than one quadrant. If it is uh, seen in an asymptomatic patient, so somebody who does not have any symptoms, you're seeing them for screening, that is actually, that is considered to have with it 0% risk of malignancy, because the idea is if it's something so large, if it's not palpable, that's just the way that she is made. On the other hand, if this is seen in a diagnostic setting or is palpable, this is something that needs to be biopsied and worked up. A focal asymmetry um, can reflect malignancy, but uh, around one to 2%. And then a developing asymmetry, something that is changing over time, carries with it the highest uh, positive predictive value of malignancy, which is 13% in a screening asymptomatic population and upwards of 27% in a diagnostic population. So by definition, then a developing asymmetry, uh, which has anywhere from 13 to 27% risk of malignancy is a BIRATS category four. Whenever it is that you see it, it behooves you to sample. So let's look at a couple of cases. And asymmetry, um, I um, sort of uh, mentioned it or, or implied it rather, is basically something that is asymmetric on one side than the other. This is why we hang mammography the way that we do um, as mirror images of each other both sides, because in general, most of the body is relatively symmetric. And when we start seeing tissue that is uh, different or present in one area, but is not present in the mirror image of it on the other side, that starts raising some flags because this is something that sort of does not belong. Doesn't mean it cannot be benign, but it's something that should alert um, a radiologist. So here we see uh, MLO views and there is an area, actually two areas, but there's uh, uh, definitely an area in the upper breast that is sitting in the posterior third depth that is not apparent and is, seems to be posterior to the rest of her fibrovaginal tissue uh, is not um, symmetric to the contralateral side. And this is her CC views. And you see that um, it is actually also has a correlate in the CC view uh, in the outer uh, quadrant. So this is now called a focal asymmetry because we see it in two views and certainly not present in the contralateral side. So this is something that uh, does require a uh, diagnostic workup. So this person should be recalled from screening, re receive a Barrett's category zero, and we should proceed with the diagnostic mammogram to evaluate this asymmetric tissue on one side um, further compared to the other. So... It's a very long animation. Um, so we did do spot compression views. Again, we do those to incre increase our resolution. And we see that, yes, the, the area is still apparent, but there's um, interspersed fat and fibroglandular tissue. Nothing necessarily discrete there. Doesn't quite look like a mass, um, no architectural distortion, no calcifications. We then proceed with a, a, a targeted ultrasound to the region, and we saw no sonographic uh, correlate for the palpable uh, for the uh, focal asymmetry. And again, with the appearance of fat and interspersed uh, isodense tissue to fibroglandular tissue, what are our thoughts that this might be? Well, it probably is just the way she's made. And this is just asymmetric benign parenchymal pattern for this woman, but we don't know. It could be something that is uh, potentially developing and evolving over time. As such, although our suspicion is low because there was nothing on an ultrasound and nothing that was definitively apparent um, 
or suggestive of a discrete finding on mammography, we should follow it up in six months with a diagnostic mammogram because that's what we see it on. We didn't see anything in an ultrasound to make sure that the pattern remains stable. And if, if it does, then that's probably just her normal parenchymal pattern. That's the way this woman is made. But wait, what if this patient remembered that she actually had prior mammograms and brought, this, brought those for comparison and the finding is now new? Does that change or alter your recommendation and uh, Barrett's assessment? Well, it should. Because even though we didn't see anything sonographically, if this focal asymmetry is new, it's no longer just a focal asymmetry, it is a developing asymmetry. It's something that is changing over time. As such, this is something that has a PPV of malignancy of greater than, certainly than 2%, but it's anywhere from 13 to 27%, and as such requires a biopsy. Since we didn't see it on ultrasound, the only way to biopsy it is under mammography, and a stereotactic guided biopsy is recommended. So to summarize um, asymmetry management, if you see after further evaluation an asymmetry, which is in one view, and you can actually uh, find the corresponding tissue that creates the summation artifact in the other view, you can assess it after workup as virus category one. A global asymmetry in an asymptomatic patient, again, a screening patient, is assessed as Barrett's category two, benign, this is how she's made, because the risk of malignancy of something so large to not have been palpable um, is zero, Barrett's category two. Focal asymmetry, if you had no prior examinations available for comparison, which is only really the only time you can call it that, um, is assessed as probably benign and followed to ensure that this is just normal parenchymal pattern in six short-term interval follow-up with a mammogram. A developing asymmetry, on the other hand, um, as long as it doesn't have a benign uh, correlate on ultrasound like a simple cyst, is inherently suspicious and virus category four um, is given to assess it and tissue sampling is recommended. All of these, by the way, are uh, uh, listed as uncomplicated. And by that, it, it's meant that there are no other associated suspicious features. There's no skin retraction, nipple retractions, calcifications, or uh, architectural distortion. If you're, all you're seeing is truly just asymmetry, this is the appropriate management. So this is the next case, which is a six-year-old woman. She actually had a history of prior lumpectomy presented for annual surveillance, just screening mammography. She is asymptomatic. So this is her 2014 mammogram on the top, 2015 on the bottom. We can see the post-surgical clips. Uh, you see a little bit of nipple. She had a periolar incision and lumpectomy. Um, and then when we compare 2014 to the following year, we see that there is now more tissue, more density, um, uh, right in uh, central upper breast in the area of her lumpectomy. It's certainly asymmetric to the contralateral side, so we'd call it a focal asymmetry seen in two views, but what's more, it certainly has changed um, compared to just the year before. So now we are already suspicious that we're going to call this a developing asymmetry and call this patient back. That's what we did. We did spot compression views and we see nothing necessarily discrete, but certainly, you know, it is there, it persists, there might be interspersed fat. Some of the distortion that you're seeing is from her post-surgical changes, but it, uh, the point and the fact is that it has already demonstrated an interval change. We did do an ultrasound to see if we could find a correlate and indeed we saw this irregular, pretty vague, hypopoic poorly circumscribed mass actually has this echogenic halo, which is no longer a Barrett's um, uh, descriptor, but it certainly is present with some vascularity. So our, um, certainly our suspicion is high and our recommendation is uh, Barrett's category four, and we can sample it under ultrasound uh, sonographic guidance since we saw a sonographic correlate. But what if the ultrasound was negative in this case? Would that change anything? Well, it would only change the mode of biopsy. As we mentioned, developing asymmetry already has proven change, there, uh, that it is changing. There's no point to follow it uh, in six months because what are you looking for? Since if it's already proven to you that yes, I am here and I am changing. It can be Barrett's too because this is something that is developing over time and has a PPV of greater than 10%. 
Um, and therefore, bias category four for developing asymmetry is recommended. We can't send under ultrasound if it's sonographically occult. So stereotactic guided biopsy is recommended. And by the way, MRI has no real role in evaluation of um, asymmetries or palpable areas of concern. So you would proceed with a stereotactic guided biopsy. Here's another case, screening mammogram 2015 and now 2016. And over time, we're now seeing that in the central upper breast, there has been a development of a focal asymmetry. Certainly there wasn't really much before. Uh, so this is something that's changing over time. Uh, we did diagnostic mammogram, it, it persisted certainly on spot compression views, and we did an ultrasound and we saw this um, irregular mass with a feeding vessel, some uh, posterior acoustic shadowing, irregular, poorly circumscribed, relatively vague. We thought it correlates. It says right, the sonographer found it at the right 12 o'clock axis, three centimeters from the nipple. That really does track with the location on mammography. Um, and the size was appropriate. So uh, since this was developing, tissue sampling is recommended in addition to its suspicious features. So we've performed an ultrasound guided core biopsy. You can see the needle here, pre-fire, post-fire, appropriately sampling it. And then we performed our post-procedure mammogram uh, after clip placement. So do we let this patient go? Well, the reason we do uh, oftentimes our post-procedure mammograms after clip placement is to evaluate for its correlation with a, if previously seen, mammographic query finding. And uh, what we noted on the post-procedure mammogram that in fact, the clip is significantly anterior um, to the queried mammographic region. Um, so it's not that we didn't sample the mass appropriately. We certainly did. We, can, we have sonographic images documenting appropriate sampling. It's just that whatever we saw on ultrasound was not a uh, correlate for the mammographic developing asymmetry. So what's the best course of action? As we talked about before, this is something that changed over time. It has to be sampled one way or the other. Since we didn't see a sonographic correlate, as we've proven after uh, biopsy, stereotactic guided biopsy is recommended. And in fact, uh, this ended up being uh, two sites of invasive ductal carcinoma. So important to evaluate post-procedure mammogram, making sure that your clip actually corresponds uh, if you sonographically sampled it to the area you queried originally on mammography, in particular in the setting of developing asymmetry. All right, next let's uh, quickly talk about nipple discharge, also not an uncommon uh, presentation uh, in breast clinic. There are two types of nipple discharge, physiologic and pathologic. Physiologic discharge is usually, it can be, it's usually bilateral, can be unilateral. Uh, it's usually non-spontaneous, meaning it is, uh, although it can be, uh, meaning it, it's manually elicited or after compression with a mammogram. But most importantly, it has characteristic colors such as milky, yellow, green, brown, or gray. Doesn't sound very good, but this is not pathologic discharge. Causes are, um, there are many causes. In particular for milky nipple discharge, women who have breastfed in the past or have been pregnant in the past can actually have milky, dish, uh, milky nipple discharge for years after cessation of breastfeeding. But in a woman who hasn't had, uh, has not been pregnant and has significant uh, milky um, nipple discharge, something to consider and to recommend correlation with uh, for the internist is the potential for hyperprolactinemia, which can be secondary certainly to some medications, many medications, or endocrine tumors such as pituitary adenomas. But this is only in a patient who has never breastfed, never been pregnant, and significant milky discharge. But the point is, none of these descriptors uh, should trigger any imaging evaluation because these are physiologic, not pathologic. The rest of the colors is just basically debris in the duct. Pathologic discharge, uh, on the other hand, is defined. It's usually unilateral. You usually actually can see the bead of discharge localized to a single duct. And it's usually spontaneous, meaning it actually just comes out on its own. Uh, a woman notice it, notices it on the inside of her bra. And its colors are clear, bloody, or serosanguinous. The workup for uh, pathologic nipple discharge really just depends uh, or relates to what is the differential diagnosis of nipple 
uh, uh, pathologic nipple discharge. And that is really two entities, papillomas and ductal carcinoma in situ. And it's actually much more commonly, seven out of eight times, uh, bloody, clear, or serosanguineous nipple discharge is secondary to a papilloma. And in a minority of the time, it's due to DCIS. Since we're looking for an intraductal mass, um, and for something like DCS, which usually presents as calcifications. Uh, workup for nipple discharge begins with a diagnostic mammogram with the retroareolar spot compressor or magnification views, looking either for a mass, dilated duct, intraductal mass, or abnormal suspicious calcifications. If that is negative, we would also proceed with an ultrasound to interrogate the retroareolar region. If these are negative, and you do see that the pathologic nipple discharge is confined to a single duct, the appropriate management now is not to do a ductogram, but actually to refer to surgery for potential consultation for duct excision. They can actually do that um, uh, based on physical exam and, and further eliciting the discharge and marking the duct. So here's a 42 year old who presented with a single duct bloody nipple discharge, it was spontaneous. This was her uh, diagnostic mammogram um, of that side, scattered fibrogranule tissue. We really didn't see anything on mammography. We did a targeted ultrasound and what we saw was a focally dilated duct retro areolar. This is the shadow of the nipple within which there is certainly um, some, an echogenic mass. Um, this could, this, so there's an introductal finding. This raises your suspicion. This can, um, this would warrant further interrogation with a core biopsy tissue sampling under ultrasound, because this is how we, um, this is, uh, we see it only on an ultrasound. And your differential here is certainly in the setting of bloody nipple discharge is papilloma, which is indeed what this was, but this could also reflect clot or debris if, uh, since we don't see necessarily any flow within the mass. Um, Another case, 42-year-old with bloody nipple discharge, and this woman um, on her diagnostic mammogram has these characteristic linear branching calcifications. And you note that they're not necessarily immediately retroareolar, and there's a little nipple retraction, uh, but they certainly are in the upper outer quadrant, sus very suspicious for DCIS, um, and are most likely the cause of her bloody nipple discharge and on bi stereotactic guided biopsy. In fact, this was DCIS, um, and the bloody nipple discharge is just happening downstream. DCIS can also be discontinuous with areas of calcifications uh, discontinuously so, so the whole duct was actually excised in the setting, um, in, the, in the setting of this clinical presentation in this patient. And then finally, although not a common uh, step in evaluation of nipple discharge, uh, at least not no longer in the United States, so I wanted to quickly touch on a on uh, the procedure for a ductogram, which also historically has been used for evaluation of uh, uh, bloody nipple discharge. Um, it can also still be performed to help guide surgical management. And basically uh, what we use a tuberculin syringe, so quite small, a very small needle, which we bend. Um, and the classic teaching is that if you are unable to cannulate the duct with a needle, the duct is not abnormal enough. Although a lot of it also re uh, relates to skill and experience. We then uh, inject very gently, uh, iodinated contrast, the same as, that is used for CT, which is diluted with uh, saline solution very gently because these ducts are uh, very um, fragile and with forceful injection can actually rupture and that and the uh, rupture with iodinated contrast in the breast can cause a chemical mastitis, which is quite uncomfortable to the patient. But what we look for as we inject, and we can see this duct in the nine o'clock axis here, that is being opacified with contrast is a filling defect. This is similar to fluoroscopy. And we see here a 0.3 centimeter uh, filling defect in one of the branches of the nine o'clock axis uh, duct. Uh, and excision of the same day uh, yielded a papilloma. Uh, what's helpful sometimes for surgical management is that when we do the ductogram the same day, if we do them the same day um, as a surgical excision, we can also mix the adenated contrast with methylene blue, which is then visible for the surgeon, marks that duct, and they can just easily excise it. All right. Nipple retraction um, or inversion um, is um, not uh, a very common, but um, 
it, it is certainly is a symptom that is seen in breast imaging. And really the management depends on uh, the patient history. So correlation with chronicity is essential. If this is something that a woman has had, and that's usually the case over a long time, which she can either relate to you or something that you can assess by comparing to multiple prior mammograms. If the nipples have always been retracted and inverted, then this is a process, a benign process that happened in the past or just um, congenital retraction and inversion. If on the other hand, um, this is an acute process you compare to prior mammogram from last year and um, it was not previously retracted or inverted, uh, or the patient mentions to you that no, in fact, she did notice that the, the nipple has started going in more over time, then further evaluation certainly is necessary. Having said that, most commonly nipple retraction inversion still results from benign processes. Most take place gradually, more often are bilateral, but even if unilateral and rapid, although your suspicion for malignancy is higher, so you should uh, be evaluating, interrogating it further, Benign etiologies are also associated with rapid developing and inversion, as you can imagine something such as a recent infection, um, a uh, post-surgical scarring, certainly if she had a history of surgery, uh, fat necrosis is causing retraction or recent Mondor's disease. So any sort of inflammatory recent process can trigger and retract some of the Cooper's ligament and retract the nipple uh, back in. But again, if it's uh, acute and relatively rapid and certainly unilateral, you need to certainly be a little bit more alert and cognizant of uh, evaluating for uh, the presence of malignancy. If you have no history, certainly, or if the history is non-contributory, uh, the mammographic workup is required, which includes spot compression views with the nipple and profile. This is something we wanna do always for a good uh, mammographic technique. And then magnification uh, views in CC and uh, lateral view to assess for any calcifications if these are seen. And if the mammogram is negative, you still wanna uh, integrate with an ultrasound for the highest negative predictive value. So this is a 76 year old who presents for screening. She did not report um, any um, uh, symptoms However, um, we noticed that she had uh, a right nipple uh, inversion and certainly is asymptomatic to the contra or asymmetric to the contralateral side and was not present there the year before. Um, spot compression views were performed and what we saw, you can see this, this is actually the inversion of the nipple and profile that you can see very nicely. There is a speculated mass in the retroareolar region that is causing this retraction with an additional speculated satellite region uh, in a segmental distribution just uh, uh, posterior to it. Ultrasound was performed and we saw, this is right behind the nipple, this irregular hypochoic mass, uh, poorly circumscribed posterior shadowing with a feeding vessel, which uh, was in a, a secondary mass, which were both compatible with two site multifocal, because in the same quadrant, invasive ductal carcinoma causing nipple retraction. The nipple had to be removed because it was involved uh, in the lumpectomy specimen. Finally, uh, let's talk about the other uh, gender, which is uh, males presenting with breast concerns. So that is not um, actually uncommon. Males can have breast cancer, but also can have a benign presentation um, of uh, breast processes. So the normal adult male breast is composed of fat, atrophic ducts, and stromal elements. And that actually dictates most of the pathology that can be present um, on, uh, in the male breast. Since there are no Cooper's ligaments or really no lobular development uh, in a male, because that is stimulated by estrogen and progesterone, it can happen certainly depending if there is a hormonal imbalance, um, if uh, it is um, a transgender person, there are certainly uh, instances of lobular development, but as a rule, uh, male breast has very little to no lobular development. Because it is very rare, processes related to lobular proliferation are extremely uncommon. So fibroadenoma, phylloides tumors, invasive lobular carcinoma, and LCIS is very uncommonly seen in the male. On the other hand, processes related to ductal and stromal proliferation may occur, such as benign gynecomastia, invasive ductal carcinoma, 
DCIS, and papillary neoplasm. So those are seen. So here's a seven-year-old uh, male presenting with a new, very tender right mass uh, or right palpable area of concern. We can see that this is a male usually because there is a paucity of breast tissue. Uh, the nipples tend to be small and there are usually much larger uh, pectoralis muscles uh, that are apparent in uh, both on MLO and CC views. We can see that we have our palpable marker demarcating patient's palpable area of concern, but what we can see um, that although asymmetric in amount, there are is bilateral um, flame-shaped tissue that is centrally emanating from the nipple, the much larger on the right, which corresponds to patient's palpable area of concern. This characteristic flame shape. Uh, flame shape uh, distribution of uh, mammographic density that is emanating centrally from the nipple is compatible with benign gynecomastia. It's interesting that that is tends to be, for whatever reason, often asymmetric. Um, and the tenderness uh, of the presentation further reassures or reaffirms the diagnosis. Um, as when gynecomastia does develop, there's a lot of, in its acute process or acute phase, there's a lot of hyperplasia uh, of the tissue in edema, which causes uh, pressure, tension, and pain. So commonly, benign gynecomastia presents, although asymmetrically, with tenderness and pain. Um, and then um, uh, does uh, with time uh, senescence. It's another patient who is 61 years old with increased left breast tenderness again in a palpable area of concern. And now we see again bilateral mammograms, MLO, and CC views, and there's hardly really any uh, retroareolar tissue uh, or tissue behind the retroareolar uh, right breast. However, corresponding to palpable area on the right, we now see florid, although flame-shaped still, centrally emanating tissue. Um, again, centrally emanating from the nipple, corresponding to patient's tender palpable area of concern, compatible with benign asymmetric gyn uh, gynecomastia. Uh, common pattern. So what is gynecomastia? It is benign excess male breast tissue. It's usually reversible. It can occur at any age, but um, it actually has um, trimodal distribution. So it's commonly not that we image, but it is seen in uh, newborn male infants uh, due to estrogen exposure in utero, and then in adolescent boys and older men. And those are the two time points when there is hormonal imbalance. Uh, which basically defines teenage years. And then um, sort of as uh, testosterone starts waning um, in uh, men over age 50 and 60. So the cause of gynecomastia really is any hormonal imbalance of estrogen, estrogen relative to uh, testosterone and other androgens. There are a lot of drugs that can actually cause this hormonal imbalance and gynecomastia, including common drugs used for hypertension um, and cardiac disease, such as thiazide diuretics, spironolactone, digoxin, certainly cimetidine, nifedipine, as well as some more illicit drugs like marijuana and heroin. Um, there are systemic disorders that can cause hormonal imbalance, such as advanced alcoholic cirrhosis, hemodialysis, COPD, and malnutrition. Um, and you can consider, in particular, in younger males, uh, estrogen tumors. So if, if they don't quite fit into the bimodal, or trimodal, but the distribution of adolescent boys and older men, uh, and let's say it's a man that is presenting in his mid-30s or early 40s with gynecomastia, you may consider some, certainly medications first and foremost, but uh, you may raise the possibility of estrogenic tumors, such as um, uh, testicular tumors, which are common in that age group, pituitary adenomas, adrenal carcinomas, hepatoma. But in general, majority of gynecomastia, uh, in particular if it meets, meets the uh, appropriate age distribution, is idiopathic. It's usually palpable, it's tender, it's firm, mobile disc, like a mound of tissue right behind the nipple. Its hallmark is that it's central in symmetric location under the nipple. Often, for whatever reason, it's unilateral or asymmetric, even though it's a system process. I don't think anybody knows why. There are three patterns. 
and I demonstrated two of them. The florid is that acute process when it's large, irregularly marginated subareolar density. It's because that's the acute first initial process when it's actually developing because there's pathologically and interstitial edema and hyperplasia, it is painful and tender. Then with time, uh, the hyperplasia comes down, decreases, edema disappears or be, be, gets absorbed. Um, and that usually happens over several months to maybe a year and a smaller flame shape centrally emanating um, pattern arises uh, with this dendritic pattern that you can see here. Uh, pathologically, you mostly see stromal fibrosis. And finally, diffuse uh, is uncommonly seen. Usually it's due to exogenous estrogen um, uh, administration uh, and basically mimics mammographic appearance of heterogeneously dense breast male, uh, female uh, tissue. This is in contrast to male breast cancer, which does happen. Um, and this is a 42-year-old man who presented with right palpable area of concern. And yes, certainly we see bilateral flame shame tissue uh, on the left and the right, but then we see corresponding to palpable area of concern. There's, first of all, something that's of much greater density in the contralateral side, but it is also eccentric. Here's a nipple. It is eccentric. Uh, and more in the upper outer breast, and you can actually see some speculation. So it's not centrally emanating from the nipple. Uh, and this was confirmed with spot compression views. You can see the spicules. It is not beautifully sort of triangular pointing towards the nipple in this um, demonstrating this uh, uh, central pattern. This is much more concerning for um, a, uh, a mass a malignant, uh, of malignant etiology. We interrogated further with a target ultrasound to see this large, irregular, uh, poorly circumscribed mass right behind the nipple. It's vascular. Um, and this, not surprisingly, was invasive ductal carcinoma uh, that uh, caused patients palpable area of concern. So male breast cancer usually uh, presents as a palpable area of concern. We don't screen men, at least not yet. So they're usually presenting clinically. And it's usually painless, unlike gynecomastia. Um, it, there are multiple risk factors for breast cancer. Uh, BRCA2 uh, gene mutation is one. Male carriers with BRCA2 gene mutation have about 7% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Others include Kleinfelter, family history of breast cancer, estrogen therapy. And they tend to present first of all, because they're presenting symptomatically uh, rather than on screening at larger sizes in female. And there is axillary adenopathy in about 50% of the cases. Um, uh, on imaging, we see most of the time just the mass. It's usually subareolar, which is where most of the breast tissue is, but it is characteristically eccentric to the nipple with convex or speculated margins because it's a mass. Um, and um, there's, as I mentioned, usually uh, in half of the cases already uh, level one or two uh, metastatic adenopathy because they tend to have later presentation than uh, women counterparts. So that is it. Uh, it was a whirlwind tour through some of the common presentations that are seen in um, breast imaging. And thank you all very much for uh, your attention. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Wonderful, comprehensive tour, Dr. Doddleson. Um, I have a couple questions from the audience here. Um, Ernest Odongo is asking, what are contraindications to ductograms other than mastitis? Um, there are re really none. Um, so mastitis is one. So if there's a, a recent infection, you don't want to worsen it with, uh, with a ductogram. Um, it is just something that has um, certainly with uh, in the last couple of decades have fallen out of favor, at least in the United States, um, as uh, surgeons are becoming more uh, better reliant and better trusting of mammographic and sonographic images, as well as surgical excision of just uniform ducts. There's also ro some role for um, evaluation with breast MRI if it's helpful for a surgeon, because actually sensitivity is quite um, high for breast MRI for evaluation of both TCIS and uh, papillomas. That is not a required part of management, but it certainly is something that can be offered to the surgeon if helpful. Excellent. Um, I have another question here uh, from Juan Anton Venter. Are there instances where ultrasound guided VABB is preferred to true cut biopsy? Um, thank you for that question. I'm not sure what is meant by true cut. Is that excisional biopsy? 
Is that what's meant by that? What is um, actually removing the mass? I'll give Anton Juan Anton a few minutes to maybe uh, further explain. Um, in the meantime, I have another question. Uh, shout out to our breast fellowship director, Dr. Jade Watkins, who was discussing this topic two days ago. Uh, speaking of axillary lymphadenopathy, we've been seeing a rise in axillary lymphadenopathy with COVID vaccines, and we've been seeing them in all sorts of imaging, including screens and diagnostic mammograms. How have you been dealing with that? That is a fantastic and very charged question. Um, so, you know, I think the evidence is evolving. Uh, we certainly saw, we were actually the first at Cornell to publish uh, and describe seeing uh, axillary adenopathy to consider that it's just reactive secondary to COVID. Because obviously uh, seeing unilateral axillary adenopathy in the past has always been concerning to alert us to evaluate for the presence of ipsilateral breast cancer. Now we noted with a rollout thankfully, um, and hopefully it will extend more globally soon with the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, which elicit a very strong immune response, which is what we want, uh, increased reactive adenopathy, which is the body just doing what it's supposed to do and working, uh, unilateral, ipsilateral to the contralateral side. So originally, when the Society of Breast Imaging recommendations were made, they were made very early uh, in um, our um, understanding of adenopathy and were made uh, purposefully conservatively. And that was to call back every patient with unilateral axillary adenopathy to correlate with history of recent COVID vaccine, to interrogate further if needed, either with ultrasound if not done, um, and to follow them up for a short-term interval about 12 weeks to ensure resolution or decrease in adenopathy. Now, what certainly that resulted in is uh, a huge onslaught of cases, which are not, uh, as well as a lot of media misinformation that alert, alert our patients that we might be missing breast cancer or COVID-19 can look like breast cancer. So there's a lot of um, um, misinformation that was out there for our patients. And I think that a um, couple of things to consider. So first of all, if the, in the way we are managing it here at Cornell, and I think many other institutions, including MGH, are following um, suit is that now that we've been seeing so much, so many of these cases with the appropriate history, when you can speak to the patient or the patient provides this information to the technologist or the mammographer of recent ipsilateral um, uh, vaccination of COVID-19, the nodes, even though they're thickened, but they're morphologically overall, otherwise normal. Um, and this is what we do as mammographers. We'll look at the breast always and we evaluate, make sure there are no other signs of breast cancer. Many of us are assessing these as a Barrett's category too. Now, if the node is really abnormal, uh, there's no fatty hilum anymore, even with appropriate history, we tend to call them back to just investigate it further. Another thing to remember is that, um, you know, the thought was the 12 week follow up interval that was provided was based on prior information because certainly other vaccinations have caused uh, uh, reactive adenopathy such as HPV vaccine in teenagers, BCG vaccine around the world, even the flu vaccine. Um, and reactive nodes tend to resolve relatively quickly. What we've been seeing now with COVID-19 is that because the immune response is so strong, they actually linger a little bit past the 12 week mark and more data is forthcoming from many institutions about the length of time. But I think something to also remember, which sometimes is forgotten by some of our residents and fellows is that, you know, if a node is actually shrinking or decreasing, and it, even if it's not quite normal yet, a metastatic node would never do that without therapy. Right. You can comfortably give it a bias category too and say it is behaving uh, in um, concert to what you expected it to be the ideology of adenopathy. And I think finally, the most important thing is to try to uh, be, to try to use this opportunity to educate our patients and inform them of the importance of really getting both, right? So many of our patients don't have the flexibility to reschedule their COVID-19 vaccine. There are so many fewer appointments, they're hard to come by or they're screening mammograms. The most important thing is to get both because both are very important to a woman's health and to be empowered to share her history uh, with uh, her mammography. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we have a clarification from Juan Anton. Uh, true cut needle biopsy 
is the clarification. So I guess VABB versus through cut needle biopsy. I'm um, not sure that I am familiar with what that um, in, entails. I will say that if you're referring to excisional biopsy, so we do all our um, here, we do all our biopsies um, as ultrasound guided, minimal or stereotactically or MRI, minimally invasive um, image guided biopsies without uh, making incisions, uh, without, well, MR biopsies, we make a quick uh, incision to insert the um, obturator uh, and without stitches. Uh, an excisional biopsy, which is something done by the surgeon, can be done if A, you cannot, um, for whatever reason, perform the biopsy. So let's say there are calcifications which require stereotactic guided biopsy, her tissue uh, thickness or breast thickness compresses to below two centimeters, it would be very challenging to perform a stereotactic guided biopsy, or it's so far posterior or very close anterior to the nipple that it would be challenging to do a biopsy, then excisional biopsy should be performed if you're giving it a virus category four which means tissue sampling. So that can be done by a surgeon. And I will say that now, uh, certainly our mammographic techniques are improving in our ability to access a lot of, especially with tomosynthesis guided biopsies, a lot of regions um, is um, improving in the breast, even the more challenging ones, thus decreasing the need for excisional biopsies. And finally, if you biopsied something and it came back as benign and you as a radiologist deemed it discordant, that it does not sort of jive with uh, your suspicion or what you thought it was on imaging, then a patient should go to excisional biopsy uh, with a surgeon, surgical removal. I guess this partly answers another question by Diodoné uh, Diora Neneo. Uh, with your experience, does FNA have obvious role in diagnosing breast cancer? Great question, actually. So yeah, where I trained, I trained at NYU and we um, had a a uh, fantastic cytology department that was actually present uh, with us during uh, the time of biopsy, which was very helpful, where the cytologist actually gave us immediate feedback. They looked under the microscope and told us, first of all, are there sufficient cells and would, get, would give us a preliminary uh, diagnosis. If we got malignancy, that would trigger an ultrasound guided core biopsy because what's helpful with that is that on cytology, even if you get malignancy, it's very difficult to stain for markers, which is something that is uh, important information for patient management uh, and for um, the clinical management team uh, to have as they advise the patient. So yes, um, but not fully. Absolutely. Um, a few more questions. We have a very motivated audience. Anamika Jha uh, says, hello, thank you for the talk. When do we need to do mammography for males presenting with subarealar tender lesion? Would sonography be done first and is enough? Great question. So actually, it's also the... Um, the discrimination is based on age. So according to ACR report risk criteria in a male over age 25, with any palpable area of concern, you would start with mammography and proceed with an ultrasound if needed. And in a male under age 25, because similar to women, I mean, in general, in the male population, risk of breast cancer is low, uh, but certainly in somebody who is younger than 25, that is exceedingly uh, uncommon. You would start with an ultrasound and may even be done if you see benign gynecomastia sonographically. Awesome. Another question by Eric Hernandez. Do you have any good breast imaging textbook recommendations? Oh, that's uh, a fantastic question. You know, actually, I don't because uh, I feel like the field is evolving so rapidly uh, that the best way to keep abreast, no pun intended, is to uh, read articles. So um, Journal of Breast Imaging that the SBI, Dr. Harvey and SBI started 2018, I believe, right before the pandemic has incredible is an incredible resource, I think, for trainees and um, senior seasoned breast imagers alike, in addition to obviously some of the other common um, art, uh, journals like radiology, radiographics, AGR, clinical imaging, but Journal of Breast Imaging um, is a fantastic resource, usually with great review articles, with up-to-date, um, very recent uh, updates on uh, original research of uh, novel techniques in breast imaging. I think that's uh, probably the best resource for a field that is moving so rapidly forward. Wonderful. 
I believe we have enough time for one last question. Uh, this one is from Tenzin Laid on uh, lactating mother presenting with unilateral bloody nipple discharge after a few days of delivery. Should we be concerned for any abnormalities and send her for a mammogram? Absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, you know, we tend to be very um, sort of careful uh, with um, a recently, you know, postpartum breastfeeding patients or pregnant patients. But remember that in this patient population, uh, pregnancy associated breast cancer is a very real possibility because, uh, and that is a breast cancer that is diagnosed with during pregnancy or within a year of delivery. Uh, you have a few abnormal cells and then you have the surge of estrogen and progesterone during the uh, during pregnancy, uh, whether it went to completion or not, that actually makes it run amok. Uh, and pregnancy associated breast cancer tend to have a worse prognosis than screen detected cancers. They're, they're still figuring out why, whether it's presentation stage or the actual etiology. But uh, with, in the setting of bloody nipple discharge, we absolutely should be evaluating her with a mammogram and an ultrasound to exclude the presence of uh, PABC or malignancy. Also remember, I know in the past, we were very uh, careful not to image with mammography pregnant and breastfeeding women. That is no longer the case. So uh, physicists have um, assessed very carefully, in particular with our uh, novel and better techniques, low dose mammography, uh, the risk to the fetus. We obviously, every woman, we shield her with uh, a lead apron, whether she's pregnant or not. The uh, um, exposure from a mammogram is negligible to none. Uh, in particular, after the first trimester, there's really no risk to the pregnancy, uh, while the uh, benefit of potentially diagnosing a PABC is significant. And also for breastfeeding women, there's no contraindication uh, in doing um, a mammogram. In the past, we thought we wouldn't be able to see it because of you know, just the uh, hyperdense lactating tissue. But in particular with tomosynthesis we, and, and the increased sensitivity of FFDM, uh, that has improved. MRI with contrast is contraindicated in the setting of breast MRI or any MRI in the setting of um, uh, pregnancy because gadolinium could cross the placenta. But other than that, all breast imaging should be performed adequately when you're suspecting malignancy. Wonderful. And with this final question, we conclude today's grand round. Thank you all for joining us for this rich and comprehensive breast imaging grand rounds. Thank you, Dr. Doddleson, for presenting and I will wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Dr. Wazen, and take care yeah. of yourself. Bye. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Dolson. Thank you all. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you.